Hi, and welcome back to the European VC, your podcast for insights into the European VC industry. If you love our show, do drop us a review, share it with your friends, and join our Slack community at theeuropeanvc.com forward slash community. And don't forget, if you are about to raise a fund or an international round, do let us know and we'll be happy to introduce you to relevant investors. Today, we're happy to welcome you to Danielle, founding partner at The World Fund. The fund was launched just this October 2021, focusing on funding climate tech companies and has the ambition to be their largest climate-focused VC fund in Europe at 350 million euros. In their investment criteria, they have the interesting role of only backing startups that have the potential to save at least 100 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year. The fund focused on the key emitting sectors, energy, food and agriculture, manufacturing, buildings and transport, aiming to fill two significant investment gaps for climate tech, when it goes from lab to market and when it leaves the pilot stage to scale. Before starting today's episode, we'd like to introduce you to Four Degrees. Four Degrees is the VC Relationship Intelligence CRM that helps you source and close deals in less time. Built by VCs who recognize the power of relationship networks, Four Degrees will transform your network into a living, breathing engine of opportunity by automating the deal-making process. To learn more about how Four Degrees can help you leverage your firm's relationships to move deals forward faster, visit fourdegrees.ai forward slash EUVC. Before we get on with the episode, we want to direct your attention to our upcoming fireside on raising VC funds in certain times. Just hit up our LinkedIn page and register for the LinkedIn Live on June the 7th, 3 p.m. Central European time. Daniel, welcome to the European VC. It's super cool to have you here today. How is everything? Everything is super cool. Thank you very much for having me. I heard you're having a good day, so I'm happy about that as well. (laughs) Before we start and deep dive into the topics that we want to talk with you, I want to start by asking you to share a bit about the origin story of World Fund. And I'm asking this because you guys succeeded or are being quite successful now that I've had a quick chat with you in one of the biggest first-time fundraisers that I know of in Europe. And I'm not sure if my data is right, but it sure feels like that. So I would love to hear the origin story, what allowed you guys to reach where you are today and tease out some advice for our listeners who are aspiring and emerging managers out there. Love to do that. I have to start to say that most work is still in front of us. And this is also maybe the most important thing to have in mind that you always have to work. Of course, when you achieve things, congratulate yourself, but sleeps up again and, <laughs> and move on. So we are still in fundraising. So this goal that we have to raise 350 million. We have already more than half of it committed. So this is what let us feel confident enough to go out with it on public in October last year and to do the PR stuff because sooner or later it would have come out that we already started investing and that we have the goal to build the biggest European climate tech VC. But as I said, uh, still a long way to go. Yeah, so briefly, World Fund, as said, biggest European climate tech VC. We are investing in technologies that have the potential to save at least 100 megatons of CO2 or equivalent emissions per year. Our ratio is, and our thesis is, that everything that is able to save at least 100 megatons per year, those companies will be the most valuable companies of the next decade because we have to decarbonize. And of course, my main goal, and I'm very, very purpose-driven, is to help reverse global warming. And those brilliant founders out there have tools but lack funding. That's where we come in place. If everything goes right, we will help to reverse global warming, save humankind while earning hopefully a lot of money. The idea came in 2018. So my background is I was a journalist for the most time of my business life with a focus on venture capital and startups. So I think I have a quite untypical path before becoming a GP and IVC. Being a journalist, of course, I learned a lot about startups and VC, but then soon I also started to consult venture capitalists and uh, startups and help them understand the business model, build it and communicate it to the outer world. That's something what's super relevant, but too many founders, especially in the deep tech sector, lack. So they are super smart people, but to break it down to words and images 
Everybody understands that's the way how you gain customers, investors, and talents. So that's a challenge, but I'm, I'm, I'm think quite strong at. Also led me to um, five years working for Angela Merkel, the German chancellor from 2012 to 2017. Fantastic five years while I was consulting startups and VCs, also working on that level on politics. So having been co-responsible for her, as we called it, audiovisual appearance. And this is, I would say, what I'm bringing in at the World Fund. My storytelling, brand building capabilities and the political network. I, of course, super important detail stopped working for Angela Merkel in 2017 and started to work for Project A Ventures, a very successful venture capital fund in Berlin. Took over the communications team there, we built brands, did the communications of the ventures, and I think that also helped to help Project A. So the portfolio is full of unicorns and we also had some support here. Once this episode goes out, we will actually just have launched an episode with Sam Cash from Project A. <laughs> so, uh... Ah, very nice. Yeah, when I mentioned 2018, so basically the first roots of the idea for the World Fund came up. It was Fridays for Future, to be honest. So I personally, I'm a member of the Green Party for already more than 20 years, but I only understood how severe the climate crisis is through those young, mainly women that went on the street. And yeah, if you dig into climate science, you understand that it's severe. I don't know. I, I have no words for that. Um, people who really dig into the climate crisis and really get it, have bad weeks ahead. And that's what I had, sleepless nights. And I knew I have to dedicate my life to try to help reverse global warming. Um, luckily, I was in a position to see how brilliant founders are and how more and more climate tech startups came up in Europe, especially, and how also on the other side, the LPs were asking for those climate tech investments because they more and more wanted also to achieve an impact with the money they invest not only financial returns. And so basically it was a low brainer because the three partners I built the World Fund with, and we already had a team of 12, they luckily were already super successful investors. So not like myself with a strong political and journalistic network, but they really, Tim Schumacher, best male investor awarded in 2020 by the German Startup Awards, Daria Saharova, Best female investor awarded by the German Startup Awards in 2020. Craig Douglas already for 15 years in the venture capital space. Physicist, chemist who really understands climate tech in depth. So the four of us started the World Fund and yeah. That leads perfectly into my next question, which is I can't imagine anyone better than someone like you who's on the front race trail raising 350 million to explain to us why climate tech as a... Uh, investment opportunity is as great as it is. So I'd love to dive into that and hear from you, Daniel. How do you explain it to the LPs that you're talking to? So three aspects helped us very much in fundraising. Number one, like every other VC, you have to have track record. Don't be in dreamland. Know that investors look at the numbers. They want to know, are you able to make money out of money? As said, luckily, we as the whole team of partners have done more than 70 investments so far with a multiple of more than seven. So we have proven to be able to invest in companies that become successful and also in climate tech companies already. Most of them are really those most successful among the portfolio mm -hmm. we had before starting the World Fund. Second thing is, of course, it totally helps that people understand that the climate process is severe. They know that we have to act fast. So many ask us, why do you raise such a big fund? And then we explain it, and I can explain it to you as well. But most already know that we have no time to wait. The third thing is you have to have an idea how to get those people on board to create the perfect conditions for institutional investors who will then write the big checks. So what we have done is we invented something, what's called the pre-closing. So we still have not had the first closing. It will only happen end of Q2 this year, so end of June. We had a pre-closing last year in 2021 with more than 150 investors, high net worth individuals, family offices, but also some corporate investors. That was very successful. And this helped us to do the first investments. And when I'm speaking about perfect conditions for institutional investors to write the big checks, two things you have to have in place, the portfolio that works and convinces, and already the first moves are done. The first movers luckily helped us to build this portfolio. And then what the pre-closers also have done is to allow us to offer the same conditions to those first closers as they have. So that's something what's great. If you think that humanity is brilliant, 
<laughs> you'll love it even more when you hear that more than 150 yeah. investors invested into the World Fund, allowing us to offer the same conditions to those who come later. That's incredible. That's the, I was about to call it the VC chicken and egg problem <laughs> in the sense that everyone has a difficult time getting people to jump first. And yes, as you say, typically the bigger ones wait and they say we don't come unless we get the same terms as the first closing. And then the first closing kind of feels like, <laughs> yeah, uh, we need to do it because otherwise the fund won't close. But it does feel like someone got a better yeah. deal than me. <laughs> yeah, I have to say a big thank you here to Ecosia. They mm -hmm. were and are our first investor, and they also really helped us to kick off things. It's the biggest search engine in Europe, a search engine that is highly profitable. All numbers are transparent, so per month, they have more than three million of revenue. Around two thirds of it is pure profit. So they invested in planting trees, but they also invested into us as, as first mover. And so this gave us not only the cash to do the first investments, but also a huge credibility because those people are deep green. So others were headed then comparably easy to follow. You said something, Daniel, that I really like and I want to repeat because it is an interesting um, kind of key takeaway. You talked about track record. Let's be honest, mm -hmm. you need a track record. And then you also said, but mm -hmm. in your case, a track record doing stuff that's very close to what the World Fund will be doing. So it's proof of repeatability, right? Basically. And that's something that I always think is a good message for emerging managers to know. Let me ask you a question though on that note, because This is the first time that this team works and invests together. Am I correct to say that? As team, yes. We have done three investments before in same companies, but it's the first time we invest out of our yeah. fund yeah. that's ours. Yes. But I guess that joint experience is also part of the story of saying, you know, we, we actually, as the partners, know each other and have co-invested. And part of that story is important as well. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, let me tell you this as well. So Tim, one of the co-founders, and I, we know each other for 25 years now. So that's, of course, super relevant. Davia and Tim and I, we know each other for five or six years. Craig came as newest in the team. We know each other all together for like two years. And what's also super relevant is that basically we all brought people in as our investment team members uh, who we know for five, six, or at least three years. So we all know each other for many years and have worked together. I always say it's a long-term game and it's a people's game, right? <laughs> There is a lesson there in what you said, I'd argue. Absolutely. The market is comparably small. VCs know each other. And if you don't know each other directly, you know each other indirectly. And we do ref calls all the time, every day. So keep that also in mind to really be a good person to your partners, to the companies you've worked before, and to, of course, the founders you've been working together with. Maybe one concrete example from my side, the founder of Project A, Florian Heinemann, is one of our advisors. I can call him up every time, and he really avoided many mistakes we would have done if he wouldn't told us how it's better to do. T. Sander, another partner, having calls with him, the CFO of, of Project A, the head of IR, yesterday was here in, with her team in our office just to support us with fundraising. I wouldn't have such support from Project A if we wouldn't be friends. Yeah. yeah. And I do think that that's the beauty of the VC ecosystem that VCs in Europe have actually gotten quite good at helping each other out. We have come together as an ecosystem quite a bit. I'm curious because the elusive LP world is always interesting for our audience to hear about. And so here you give a lot of credence and thanks to your first investor. But I'm sure yeah. that you've really groomed or made sure that you used the existing investor base from the first pre-close, as you call it, to kind of get more and more in. I'm curious to hear how you've been thinking about that, because raising for such a big fund, it's not a couple of names and organizations that you have backing you. It's a large network. So my question is, how have you leveraged your existing LP base to get more and more LPs in and get the ball rolling? Okay, let me split the question in two parts. The one is, of course, relationship. A, always have in mind what I said previously, that you'll be in touch for years. If you, for example, know that one investor won't convert within this fund, stay in touch, knowing that you'll raise a second fund afterwards. And then you'll convert this kind of person much faster because there's a relationship of years. B, try to get intros from people who have earned money with you. Nobody can introduce you better than someone who already has learned that you can make money out of money. Okay, that was one A and B. The second thing is tools. 
So the tool we use is quite uncommon. I think it's Streak. It's a tool that is integrated into Gmail and it really leverages us. Within our investment team, we have a superhero. His name is Daniel Valenzuela, who is scaling us like crazy. So he's basically the master of discipline. He's the master of scale. I, I don't know how to call him. Streak is creating a huge transparency. So within our team, basically everybody can see everything, who sends emails to whom, and when was the last email sent when. And he's the guy who's really keeping an eye on, on us, the partners, so that we keep chasing the LPs. I would say having relationships, having the right tools, and also maybe a person that kicks your ass is very relevant to convert LPs. That is a great learning. I'm also curious to hear your setup inside the fund and around the fundraise. Am I right in saying that this person is focused on investor relations almost solely? To be honest, we really need to hire a dedicated head of IR. Yeah. So luckily, Daniel is doing those structured stuff for us now, but he's part of the investment team. So he's also the master of the CPP, so the methodology. He's a mathematician from Berkeley and Bonn. He's the master of the methodology that we use to estimate if a company is able to save at least 100 megatons. So we definitely need someone in place here so that then Daniel can do the stuff basically he's hired for. <laughs> I want to kind of explore something with you that we don't often talk about in this show. <laughs> it's interesting because of your background. And as you put it, you know, part of the value that you bring is also kind of the storytelling that's associated to your background and your expertise. It's really a, a topic we never really covered. I think we covered it in one episode, one of our first episodes, we talked about branding and storytelling in VC. I'd love to create here a space where we could deep dive a bit into mm -hmm. that topic. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. So how do you think about creating brand and creating a compelling story, brand story around the World Fund? I would say numbers are 80%. So I agree to 80%. But the secret sauce is in those 20%. What an investor does is basically deciding within the first 15 minutes if he or she wants to invest or not. Then, of course, a huge process starts searching basically for red flags. And when the numbers are not right, even if an investor likes you very much, you won't get this investment. Definitely not. But if the person doesn't like you in the first 15 minutes, numbers are right. You also won't get the investment. So brand plays a huge role, but brand can only work if it's authentic. Try to be the person that you are and also don't try to build something, a company that is not fitting to the people that are working for the company. So authenticity is a strong word. And if you look at it, it's easy, but it's also hard. <laughs> Brand is super relevant. Brand personality and authenticity is really easy when you're two guys in a garage because it's basically an extension of who you are, right? There's no filters, there's no bottlenecks, there's no approvals, there's no need for reviews, right? On the visual, on the copy, on the tone of voice. As you grow, that then shifts from being super easy to actually the extreme opposite, super difficult. And you guys are not necessarily a small team from inception. So how do you work on that? How do you ensure authenticity and personality, but also making sure that it doesn't take you four months to write one opinion article, right? <laughs> Yeah, now my answer is more towards recruiting because it's the people you hire. Those have to be right. And it's always three things I'm caring for. The first thing is, is the person a team player because you're building a team. The best you can see if someone is, is a team player, if things go wrong, how does this person behave then? Is it trying to blame someone else, her or himself? Or is it trying to find a solution? The latter is always the best if a person blames her or himself Second best, but worst is if it's trying to blame anyone outside. And that's a no-go. There's a wonderful book written by Robert Sutton. It's called The Asshole Factor. <laughs> uh, I think you understand why. <laughs> <laughs> Second thing, what's super relevant for us at the World Fund is climate crisis awareness. So the purpose we are in. If you understand the climate crisis, as I've said in the beginning, then you also understand that no crisis can be compared to this one. And now we have a war what I'm looking at in the news every day and on Twitter, etc. And we tend to forget that there's another crisis that is far bigger than everything. I, I, so maybe this was also not nice to compare crisis. That, that's not, but I just want to say that's existential. It's an existential threat you can't compare to anything. And when you have understood it and you are a good person and a team player, then you love humankind and you automatically try to do your best. And that's basically the third thing. The person has to be an executional person that loves his or her job, that really loves to work within a team and that is able to execute. And if you have those three things and you feel it, follow your heart, then 
as pathetic as it sounds for your, your gut, then you'll build the team that is the same as your brand. I think that in the VC space, we have the added complexity of always having two customers, being founders on the one side and LPs on the other side, and both sides need to reflect or see themselves in the communication that you're putting out. I'm curious to hear how you think about that, because founders do come oftentimes with a different profile from the more institutional LPs. Yeah, it's a super good question, especially when you are raising a 350 million fund. You can't say I only take money from, I don't know, Greenpeace. Uh, no way. <laughs> So we have included some potential LPs. Uh, I don't want to elaborate too much on that, where we just know they are basically working for global warming radically. So it wouldn't be authentic then to get those companies on board. But you have to find a story that fits all, where really everybody can stand behind kind of the flag and know it's still authentic. So, And it took us two years, to be honest, to get to this sentence that we believe that climate returns are an early indicator for superior returns. So that's something our team goes for climate and financial returns. And that's where we can really all align if investors are talents and founders. I guess it speaks to your investment process, which we could dive in a bit, you know, your framework for mm -hmm. evaluating deals. Does that yes. mean that, that you actually, rather than focus on the economic upside of a very should I say, uh, far out invention to be commercialized. There, you focus more on the impact that it might have in terms of the gigatons saved and so on, rather than thinking the commercial applications because you know that if there's going to be gigaton savings, then there's also going to be a commercial upside. Is that how you do it? or? Yes, and that's the case, definitely. So without commercialization, there won't be this megatons or even gigaton saving potential. What we have defined is when I speak about the 100 megatons of CO2 emissions per year that have to be saved by a startup to have this potential, we're talking about the year 2040 because you also have to put a, a year. Best would be that it has the potential already 2030 because we really have to reduce the concentration of greenhouse gases within the next years, the next or this decade, and next decade at the latest. So the assessment that we have set up is the CPP assessment, the climate performance potential assessment. So we are looking at the climate performance, mainly it's greenhouse gas emission reductions potential, but then also there are six factors that we look for that it's not doing any harm on water equity so that we make sure the technology is not only reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And then the business part is, of course, it has to be a business model. I mean, we are investing in startups. If they stay small, forget about the savings in emissions. So we definitely look not only at the emissions potential, but also the size of the market and everything else a VC has to look at to make sure this investment will be successful and return, in the optimal case, the fund. So as said, the CPP is for us only an additional KPI that indicates this superior returns. It helps us to decide for the financially more successful startups. You're multi-stage, so you're doing everything from early to growth. I'm curious to understand how that works because normally we tend to see in Europe more funds that are focused either on early stage or growth and then scale up. I'm curious to hear what has made you land on doing both early and growth. So growth for us is series B. Some growth investors say that's still early stage for us. So to be clear, we invest from seed to series B and the initial ticket sizes are between one and eight million euros. Why we also decided to do initial investments with five or eight million euros into series B companies is that we have learned that we also have a huge investment gap here. So we have companies that have a hardware component and if they are already Series B ready, so you had already research and development, you have already the prototype. Basically, the tech has proven to work, but still you don't have the revenue and not the profit like an e-commerce company, let's say. So VCs usually are hesitant because those numbers are not right on the first glance. Let's take Tesla. <laughs> Nobody would have invested in this hardware company building cars because, I mean, where's the profit after three or five years? And they would have been right looking at the profits after three or five years. Tesla is not a successful company, forget it. But now we all know better. And those kind of Tesla companies, we have many in the Series B stage and they don't get the funding, although it's brilliant teams, it's brilliant business models, it's brilliant tech. But of course, they can't tell you in three years, I'll return your fund. If they're honest, they'll say, if all goes well, in 10 years. In the meantime, of course, you have to sell me. But luckily, there are, especially in the US, 
huge growth climate tech funds that have popped up uh, last summer, close to 30 billion US dollars, by the way, assets in the management, who will then buy those companies, hopefully also some European growth. That's another topic we can talk about. So those companies will have the ability to grow. And if we don't fill this gap, it would be a bad thing for the planet, for humankind, but also for all the profit that is missed. I'm very curious. You know, I've spoken with some people in your team, so I, I do know there's something there. But when we're talking about the LPs, besides the, the financial returns, of course, and aside from the strategic alignment, which we've spoken about, that they do believe in this mission. And I believe that many of them are associated to you guys a lot due to that. But you're also trying to provide value to the LPs at different levels. I'd love to hear your, you know, kind of a quick breakdown to the detail possible of what that is and how do you think that has been perceived by the LPs so far if that has effectively been an important tool in the fundraising journey, for example? One concrete added value to LPs that are family offices that also love to do direct investments or high net worth individuals who also act as business agents, we have huge deal flow. And some very promising companies are just too early. They are pre-seed or maybe even seed companies that we consider too early for us. Yeah, our investor base is very happy that we have a platform where we share those deals, where we see a high probability that we will jump in a year later or two years later. Does that mean that you actually share your entire deal flow with your LP base? Or is it on a select basis that you say, these are super good, they were too early, do check them out, guys? Yeah, we pretty much know our LP base very, very good. <laughs> we just know. We also have categorized it, the streak, so we know quite often those experts also. Our LP base consists of like 11 have built unicorns, um, it's people out of the energy and the food and agriculture space. They are experts also, so they also support us in DD when we look at uh, startups, but also they support our startups that we already have invested. So we have done so far six investments. They support them also with their knowledge. The second point I wanted to make is the added value, of course, is also like, you know what's the latest, hottest shit in climate tech. Thanks to the exposure we have, so my, in all humbleness, uh, I think I'm a recognized climate tech, I don't know, thought leader sounds so big and I think it's smaller than it sounds, but I think I'm, I have quite some exposure and also creates deal flow and I know what is around there. Maybe even more, I think even more, Craig, Tim and Aria. So they really have a name within the climate tech space and they just know where you need to invest and where the best opportunities are for investments and where not. Daniel, it is about time, even though we're having a lot of fun here, that we go to the quick fire round. Are you ready for it? It is 30 to 60 second answers per question, and we've got three for you. Let's go. So the first question is, what are the main technologies that you are the most excited about in climate tech? The main, I'll, I'll name you two that we are doing deep dives now, but they are around 70. <laughs> so the most, most current is we are looking at quantum computing and trying to assess how big the climate performance potential is. It's not a direct climate tech, but it affects so many spaces. And uh, we're just checking out if it's something we should look closer at. The second thing is a comparably low-brainer, regenerative farming. It sounds boring, but the potential is huge. The way we do agriculture today is basically, and with all the subsidies, we are basically subsidizing our debt. <laughs> so usually ground is able to save carbon. And the way we do agriculture is leaving it out in the atmosphere. And the potential we, we can save with only like 0.004% increasing of carbon. We can already reverse global warming. We can take out all the carbon out of the atmosphere with only this small change. So I'm looking out for technologies that can really get our farmers to regenerative farming. This would be really a huge difference. Super exciting. I love hearing about these technologies. It's something that I don't dive into normally, but it's something that we need for my kids to be able to have a planet to live on. So yes. <laughs> next question, given the results from the Glasgow Cup this year or last year, do you think that climate-focused VC funds are more important than ever? And maybe also at the question, is there a role to play in policy for us? Yes, there's a role to play policy for us. And that's also something I'm trying to achieve together with a fantastic group of people, the Clean Tech Group. Also, there's a Tech for Net Zero Alliance based in Berlin. The first one was in Brussels. We really need to make politics and politicians aware of the potential that climate tech has. I think that's not understood by many. Let me give you some numbers, because I think in Europe, we are really 
number one. In terms of R&D, we spend hundreds of billions each year. Only on EU level, 33.4 billion will be spent into climate tech until 2027. Second is climate tech patent application. 28 percent come from Europe. Third is climate tech startups. We have more climate tech startups than anywhere in the world. If we only look at the energy startups, we did the research. We have 353 in Europe, founded between 2019 and 2021. And it's in America, 253. So it's like 50% more in Europe. But what we lack is funding. That's our problem. That's our huge problem. That's why we have so un many unfunded uh, founders. And this for politics also has to be aware of it and try to create conditions that will attract VCs to invest more in climate tech. I actually think that that is something we don't talk about often enough because there's a lot of talk about how climate tech is growing enormously and everything. But the fact of the matter is that there's still very, very good projects that go underfunded in Europe. So yes, you're completely right there. Next question, Daniel. We have two great books, John Doerr and from Bill Gates. But aside from their books, which ones should people be reading? <laughs> Wow, so many good books out there. Uh, the first I have in mind, read it last year from Rutger Breckmann, a Dutch journalist. He wrote a book that's called Humankind. I only recommend it because too many people think that humans are not good, that humankind doesn't deserve better. And I love this book because it shows you that we basically just want to do good. People are good. We want to live. We want to do good to one another. We are altruists. But we have created a system that is not always bringing the best out of us. And when you read this book, you know that it's worth fighting for ourselves. <laughs> I'd love to end on that note, but we do need to ask you also, Daniel, what's next for you and what's next for the World Fund? Next definitely is to get this first closing done end of June, either half a year or a year later, the final closing and to fund as many climate tech founders as possible. I don't know if that's a nice answer at the end. It's so dry and uh, uninspirational. Uh, yeah, maybe the most inspirational is that I hope very much that World Fund is only the first of its kind. I hope very much that we will be a role model, as many other climate tech funds out there are already as well, like 2150, you named, uh, like Pale Blue Dot, like Planet A, the Extancia. We will not be 10, 20 we will be 100 or 200. That's what I'm hoping very much for, that we as the World Fund will be a role model and on the beginning. That's amazing, Daniel. Super cool to have you here. Uh, some of the names you listed there, we've had the pleasure of interviewing uh, a team member, others not yet, but hopefully you are right. And hopefully this is a list of a few among many, many and much more. Thank you for joining us. Best of luck with the World Fund. Thank you so much. Four Degrees is the VC Relationship Intelligence CRM that helps you source and close deals in less time. Built by VCs who recognize the power of relationship networks, Four Degrees will transform your network into a living, breathing engine of opportunity by optimizing the deal-making process. To learn more about how Four Degrees can help you leverage your firm's relationships to move deals forward faster, visit fourdegrees.ai forward slash EUVC. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of The European VC, your podcast for insights into the European VC industry. If you love our show, do drop us a review, share it with your friends, and join our Slack community at theeuropeanvc.com forward slash community. And don't forget, if you would like to suggest topics or guests for future episodes, join our community and help make the best pod for everything European VC. And if you are about to raise a fund or an international round, do let us know and we'll be happy to introduce you to relevant investors.